All right, so joining us in the studio with insights as to what Ghana could do to enhance the security of the populace, uh, Kennel retired first of Wadri, who comes in with enormous experience as far as security matters are concerned. Thank you very much, uh, uh, retired. Kennel Thanks, retired right. yeah. uh, for joining us. Thank you. Now, we are also at one of Ghana's biggest charismatic churches, the Christian Action Faith Ministries International, which appears to have taken some proactive measures to enhance security for the congregation, Komla Dome is on standby to tell us about some of the measures there and what steps the church will be taking to enhance security. Now, first, though, Johnny's prime producer, Jojo Kobna, lived in Uganda for at least two years and says they take security a lot more seriously. And that frisking of members of the public is so common, they become quite used to it. Jojo joins me in the studio. Now, Jojo, you tell us about your experience in Uganda. No, let me just put this one in, in, in context, then quickly we'll build on that. In 2010, Uganda had a terrorism attack. Al-Shabaab bombed um, a cricket um, um, stadium, a, a rugby stadium, um, killing about 74 people. And so since that, Uganda has heightened its security. Um, um, its security. So what, what, would, what, would, what would happen is that you go into a mall, like how we go to the Crown Mall and we just walk in. There is no way you can walk into any Ugandan mall without being checked, properly checked. Before your car will be checked before you enter. And so when the you car will be checked. The car will be checked first before you enter. And when you enter, you will be checked thoroughly before you, you, you go, uh, you, you get into the mall. And then when you go to... Um, now hold on, with the checking of the vehicles as you're talking about, is it they using mirrors to they look use, around the They use the mirrors to, 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 to go to look around under the car and then they open the boots and then they check the various compartments. The compartments. And then they even tell As you happens to, in the hotels. Yes. yes, and then they will tell you to even step out of the car it's very common for you to just step out of the car and so you'd have to step out and then they check and then they would ask you questions but then they allow you to go so they don't really care with the traffic whether is this a random or everybody gets checked? it everybody every hotel that you go into if you go to a church it is very common it's not common it is it is the practice you are checked and many churches you see two police officers stationed outside usually they are even more depending on uh, the information that the security operatives are picking up so they, they beef up security at various churches if you're even going to taxi parks we will call it the trotro stations you, they, they even position um, security officers there where you are checked before you even board and the buses you are thoroughly checked your items are well screened before you make your way so it is heightened when you're traveling, like Kotoka International Airport, the only way you are, the only time you are, you are checked is when you enter, and then I mean, you, they, after they check your luggage, and that's that's it. At Uganda, before you get to the airport, um, several several meters before you get to the airport, you are checked. Everyone in the car will get come out. You you properly checked, and then you sit in, you drive, and then there are metal detectors. You you go through it too. And then when you get to the main airport, you are checked before your items are checked. So they check you and check you several times because they, they, they are very security conscious. And any time there is a bombing, like maybe a, a Nairobi bus bombing, then they would increase it. Um, uh, the worst case happened, then they would increase it. So it is very common for you to be stopped anywhere and you'll be checked. Where You can even be in a, in a trotro moving and then in the afternoon you'll stop, not in the evening. And then they'll check everyone. So that is how they do it in Uganda. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Jojo Kobra, bringing us that Ugandan experience there. Now, there are certainly a few things we could learn from uh, the Ugandan example, Kennel. Uh, do you think we should be going the Ugandan way, or it's probably too overbearing? Well, it is overbearing, but I think <clears throat> the question of security has trade offs with individual freedoms. So you need to sacrifice some of your comfort in order for the state to provide you with more security. The cost or the investment is worthwhile. So I think that we are even late. It looks like we're waiting until the untoward happens before we jack up. That shouldn't be the case. There are a lot of lessons that we can learn from countries within the sub-region and further afield within the continent to have learned some very useful lessons and borrowed practices, best practices, good practices. And then to get used to those practices before uh, it happens. All right. But the whole idea is that terrorists who have an estimate of your security environment, 
And currently, there are so many loopholes within the security environment. These motorbikes, for instance, the incident you mentioned in Burkina Faso, Dablo, I think they arrived on about six or seven motorbikes, 20 of them, before they attacked the parishioners as they stepped out and had time enough to go and um, uh, loot a pharmacy. In some cases, they loot cattle, um, food, and so on, and then uh, they escape. Okay, okay. All right, yeah. we'll be, I'll be coming, uh, returning to you so we can do a lot mm -hmm. more of, of uh, the analysis, but let's get to Komala Adom at the Christian Action Faith Ministries International on the Spain Tech Road here in Accra. Now, Komala, what are some of the security measures you have observed as being in place at the church. So when you get into the compound of the Action Chapel here on the Spintex Road, you will be subjected to some security checks. So your vehicle will be subjected to some checks at the, the entrance of a compound. And then when you enter and congregants attempting to enter the chapel, there are various entry points here at the chapel. So as you can see in my shorts, there's one here which has some installed detectors. So individuals who pass through these entrances will have to submit themselves to these checks. So the detectors will have to check what, whether individuals coming in have any metal objects or other foreign objects. Once they are detected, they are isolated and you are asked to stand by, step aside. So these are sorted out. But largely all the entry points, at least five of the entry points that I have been to since I came here, have these detectors. They are detecting and they are checking from congregants who are bringing foreign materials into the service. At the moment, there is the uh, midweek service happening inside. Hundreds of people have already gone through these entry points and are in the chapel at the moment worshiping. But then the security officials here are still on high alert, as you can see. All those who are coming in, whether you are young or you are old, you are subjected to these checks here at the entry points at the Action Faith Chapel, Israel. Now, Komla, how long have they been? Have these security measures you talk about been in place? Well, from my interaction with the head of security here three years ago, but in the last few months, they have intensified the security arrangements here because of some of the threats that have been recorded in parts of the region in the last few months. So uh, following the attacks in Burkina Faso, they are about to up the security uh, arrangement here, and almost all the security uh, individuals here have talkbacks that they are communicating on a constant basis, and then they ha are allowing the individuals who drive into the premises subject themselves to this check uh, before they go to come. We had to uh, intensify these security measures to protect the congregants, thousands of them who come to fellowship here every other day. Now, Komla, do we know what must have informed their decision to institute the, or introduce these security measures? According to the, my interaction with the head of security here, um, two years ago when the idea was there to increase security here, they, they recalled that uh, the numbers to reduce the troop into this particular chapel every Sunday, more than 5,000 individuals. And so it was necessary for them to institute some security measures to protect the lives of the... It was necessary for them to institute some security measures to protect the lives of the thousands of people who come here every Sunday to fellowship. And mind you, Israel, it's not only Sunday fellowships that they have. They also have midweek sessions, like what is happening in the auditorium right now as we speak. And... In there, I can tell you that hundreds of people already, the young people, old people, are already in the chapel fellowshipping. And so the, the recording of the high numbers of people to fellowship here necessitated the uh, decision by the leadership of the church to institute these security measures, they tell me. And they, what do they say was the initial reaction of the congregants, congregants when they introduced these measures? Uh, Israel, um, uh, from my interaction with the head of security, he told me that the congregants, they had to sensitize them, sensitize them that these are the measures that they were putting in place. But and when they um, increased or intensified the arrangement, they, they educate the members as and when. So if they introduce new measures, they educate the members about it, and then 
the members have the buy-in. Um, I will be joined in a short while by one of the resident pastors here, uh, Reverend Ugudai. Uh, he will join me. Let's have a quick chat. He's, uh, he's been telling me a lot about the arrangements they are going to be making. He will join us shortly. Um, thank you very much, Ray, for your time here on Join Me Prime. Pardon? Thank you very much for coming on Join Me Prime. You're welcome. And I have been speaking to the head of security here. He's been running me through some of the um, arrangements or the measures that you have put in place as a church to deal with the security threat. He told me that far back three years ago, these security measures were instituted. Can you run us through briefly what necessitated these measures you talk about that you instituted three years ago? I think um, everybody knows uh, what is happening in the world. The world is a global village. Anything you see happening somewhere should inform you that, I mean, these are the strengths. And if you watch what happened in other countries, it's enough indication that everybody needs to I mean, if they are aware of it. As recent as just about two weeks ago, even last week, you see what's happening in Sudan, you see what is happening in Burkina Faso and other places. But two to three years back, there was a lot of targeting of American interests. Hotels, even in Kenya, etc., were bombed. Et so those things prompted us. So we were hosting an international conference of EDJs coming in from the state. And because of that, you needed to be aware that we states. And because of that, you needed to be aware that, I mean, any program like that that exposes um, international community to the general public is something you need to take seriously. So we needed to make sure security was stepped up just to make sure those who were coming were safe and our own people were safe. So that's what necessitated it. Okay, and I imagine that you and the congregants have been having an interaction to sensitize them about how these processes work. How have they been taking it so far? Oh, initially it's, it's, it's a little, you know, anything that is different and anything that um, is new comes with its own challenges. Normally I walk straight into chair. Why do I have to go through a metal detector? Why do I have to queue? to be scanned, to enter into a service that I used to walk straight into. So there's a lot of frustration, you know. So it's, that's the reason why you need to educate in advance. When people know you're doing things for their own good, then they warm up. Because actually, you can see that it takes a little longer to fill the church because people need to be scanned, people need to be screened, if you like. You know, so those are the frustrations. But once people had an understanding of why these things were being done, it made it easier for them to appreciate. Besides, everybody listens to the news. Everybody sees and hears about what is going on outside. So you can under understand and appreciate the need to step up security. We have children. We have young people. We have adults. We have foreigners. The whole place is full of all kinds of people. And numbers attract crime. Now, I don't want us to go into the fine details of what exactly the measures are, etc., because we may be giving the bad guys some of the leads. But uh, did it cost so much to implement these systems? For which reason other churches can emulate this example? Well, the cost is in different levels. There is a f the cost of the, of the equipment. Higher than the, life, the price of life. So the cost of this now, the sizes of different groupings, the churches and organizations vary. Because we have a lot of entrances, we need to invest more in the number of equipment we use. If you have just two doors, then you don't need too many more. So, so the, the structure will determine the kind of investment you need to make. We have a big structure, and we have a lot of people. That's how come we need to invest more than maybe others. I think it should be scared. Right. What that assurance do you give to other people, Christians, who are scared by everything that's All right, so we're having some challenges with the line connection to Komla Adom there, but uh, Colonel Retired Professor Sobaji is with me in the studio. You have heard about some of the security measures that Christian Action Faith uh, Ministries International has put in place. What other measures would you recommend? Well, I think we need to comment churches that have seized the opportunity or the initiative to enhance their own security. Uh, we should comment that initiative to all other churches and mosques and indeed all the other facilities uh, 
uh, that you've mentioned uh, in your remarks. But more than that, because the state has the fundamental responsibility to protect citizens or persons within its borders, the state must now engage with the churches. Indeed, I would suggest that the state must make it mandatory for all churches to establish some local security mechanisms. Because ultimately, it is the state that will be blamed and held up uh, responsible. Indeed, you might know that uh, in Sri Lanka, the government of Sri Lanka has issued a directive that all sermons at most must be presented for uh, is this <laughs> approval or for approval. Indeed, it's one of the mechanisms to try and weed out, you know, um, what do you call that language? Extremist, Inflammatory, okay. Yeah, extremist language and so on. That helps to now recruit some of those individuals. So that, I think, is what we need to do. And we need to replicate it across the entire spectrum of our, you know, um, um, of, of our country. But I'm a bit concerned that since yesterday or a few days ago, the focus has been on churches. But the examples that we have about terrorist attacks, they have been very indiscriminate. They have also included mosques. They have included schools. They have included hospitals. They've included government facilities. So it's not a question of, yes, the localized examples in northeastern Burkina Faso have been against churches. But it doesn't mean that going forward, these uh, the actors are not going to attack other mosques and other facilities. So I would suggest that we all take responsibility. Even for, for your own um, studio here, you need to put in certain measures you know, to ensure that you are protected before you now um, depend on the state to provide that environment within which you, know, you can conduct your activities. Right. One other issue I'd like you to look at is the personal safety mm. or security of uh, individuals. And uh, I'll come to that in a bit. But right now, uh, I have this other clip I want to share with you. My colleague Kojo Yangsin was at the Accra Mall to conduct a little experiment about the security consciousness of the public. Let's watch this. So we have left the backpack there for over 30 minutes and nobody has raised a single alarm. The people who are sitting at, on, the de on the bench have changed over time. Only one person has remained there sitting right next to the back. But he hasn't even noticed it's there, right beneath his feet. It could be a bomb, it could be anything, but he most certainly is not bothered, and neither is anyone else. I don't know whether there's CCTV in this shopping center, but nobody has picked up the fact that I left the bag there for 30 minutes. All right, I'll go take my bag. Now, interesting. Now, before I bring in Kenneth Retard Abaji, I want to share with you some of the reactions that are coming on social media. So we have uh, Rex Omenye says, this is not the best way to do the test. Even you that did this kind of test must fall victim. Thank God, safety. Now, good people did there. If not, the back will disappear before you finish talking to the camera. All right. And we have uh, several replies. Rex Omenye, the day a bomb will explode near you, you will know the importance of this test. And uh, Paul says, I've always been thinking about this and was hoping someone tests our security at the various malls, and it just happened. I'm just scared going to these places. It's good we're walking free space and enjoy our peace, but how responsive will our security services be when some of these things happen? And then Devil Great says, please, dear Ghani, and let's stop sharing this. Uh, this is not good for our security. Stop this kind of test. Joy news. All right, and I'll, so I'll bring in uh, Colonel Retard first, Sir Waj. What do you make of the test, first of all, and the reactions that we're getting on? Uh, well, these social? tests are done by certain agencies or organizations in other countries from time to time to test the resilience of communities and society, the levels of security awareness, security consciousness. 
and to use that to draw the attention of the authorities to try and put in the necessary mechanisms to enhance security. So I wouldn't agree to those who had the adverse comments. The fact that for 30 minutes that unattended bag was left in situ uh, itself suggests that if it had been a live bomb, the person would have had sufficient time to leave the mall, get into his or her car, and leave the uh, premises before the, the bomb would and have And the gone. other information that I'm picking up is that we actually, there were actually cleaners mm. who came to clean around mm. the bag mm. and didn't so say that, that is a level of the security awareness or consciousness I refer to. I don't want to take too much of your time, but I missed the Westgate Mall uh, terrorist attack by a couple of hours. I was oh. living in Kenya. I had planned to go to the Westgate Mall. The plumber was late in coming to fix some plumbing issues, so I decided to go elsewhere. I was in that mall when I heard it on radio. You see, in Kenya currently, this wouldn't happen. Okay. In every mall, there are uniformed police and ununiformed police who are perambulating up and down. The shop owners, shop attendants, every citizen, the scanners at the entrance, taking your phone and all metals out into a basket, being scanned, you know. These are the mechanisms that they put in place. But they have learned the hard way. It looks to me that we're waiting to learn um, the lessons before probably uh, is too late for us. But we can avoid that. We can avoid that. Indeed, the level of security education within this country is almost zero. And that is very worrisome. So we need a concerted effort uh, through partnerships, NCC, the media, national security setups, and other institutions like the Kofi Annan Center and the one that you mentioned the West African Center for Counter uh, Extremism, you know, to try and one up, you know, to try and train, you know, and build capacity, build resilience within society. Because that resilience thing is very important. The government or the state alone cannot provide security for 30 million people or for X number of churches and mosques. But it is a collaborative effort. Churches, state institutions, and so on and so forth, then we can get the security that we, we all uh, need. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Retard Festus uh, Abwaje. You've been you very, very uh, helpful as always. Mm -hmm.